Good morning, family. Excited to be with you today. We are back in the Who building. It is May 3rd, 2020. And this is the day that the Lord has made. We are thankful to Him. We're thankful for every opportunity we have to gather, however we gather. We are here because we want to be here. We're here because we desire to worship Him together. So for the next, well, let's say two hours, I pray that you stay with us through all of this and that you fully join in. You fully participate in every song, in all of the worship, in the praise that is going forth. I ask that you intentionally, even right now as I'm talking, as I'm sharing, that you would turn your heart, even from the, the things going on in your home right now, the casualness of, it's so easy to be casual in the home. But I ask that you intentionally turn your heart and connect to the spirit in which we are gathering, to the one who spoke us into existence, still as in, interactive, as involved as the day he thought about us and put us in our mother's womb. He's just as involved in our lives as in that moment. And so today, Lord, we give you thanks because we believe, truly believe, that this is the day you have made. And we're going to rejoice. We're going to remember. We're going to give you what you're worthy of. We're thankful for your love. We're so thankful for your attention toward us. We are not ignorant of your goodness. We are not ignorant of your involvement. We are not ignorant of your closeness. This worship we offer today is recognition and full-on awareness of how close, how personal, how Emmanuel God is. So we trust you, God. And may our songs, may the, the song of our heart be a declaration of our trust and our awareness of your love, full participation, and genuine attention in and among all of us. We honor you and we love you. You ready? Let's go.
see things like you do.
Just when my hallelujah was tired, you gave me a new song.
forgotten you So I'm letting go
two songs here, um, these next two songs, out of the joy of being here. <laughs> not, not just because of that, but just the joy of the Lord in us. Um, so we just welcome you to maybe stand up in your home, dance a little bit. However you worship here, we'd like you to do that. Surrounded, but I'm surrounded by 
is stronger than your love. Let us remember that. Nothing. Stronger than death. Stronger than fear. Stronger than human reasoning. It's that love that never fails. I speak that over us today, the remembrance, the reminder. That love, that love never fails. Love, love never fails. I know I'm not much of a singer, but love, love never fails. That's what we trust in. Love, love never fails. It's stronger, it's stronger. Love. Love never fails. Love, love. It's bigger, it's wider, and love, love never fails. It's deeper and broader, and love, love never fails. It's more powerful. Love, love never. I sing it over the sick today. I sing it over the depressed today. Love, love never fails. Over the poor, over the wondering what's going to happen. Love, love never fails. I speak it over those who are secure in anything other than love. Love never fails. Oh, oh, love, love never fails. Nothing compares to our God. There's nothing compares to our God. Nothing. So nothing compares to our God. Come on, let that saturate your homes today. And nothing compares to our God. Let it saturate your soul. Let it saturate where you are, where you live, where you work. And nothing compares to our God. Hallelujah. Oh, we make you bigger with our praise. Nothing compares to our God. Nothing compares Compares to you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for binding us together as one, that your heart would be known in us and through us. We love you, Lord. You're worthy of this and so much more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. Man, I missed you guys. So good to be with you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us and hopefully you joined in that worship today. Hopefully it was uh, uplifting, not only to your soul, but to your home. Um, I know it did me a lot of good to be physically present with all of these ones that we're worshiping today and very thankful for the sacrifice of praise. Um, and it is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice because sometimes our feelings tell us to do something different. But to praise Him, to worship Him, to remember Him, to declare the truth of who He is, I think saturates us in the atmosphere with that which is real, that which is true, that which is right. And so declaring that there is nothing greater than the Lord, I think there's nothing more important than that. So thank you guys. That was awesome. And uh, Lauren's voice was given out on her even during practice, so very thankful that she pushed through that. It was powerful. I want to thank the Who family for giving and for continuing to give. There are many of you who have never, uh, at least not regularly or consistently, given online before, and uh, we have seen that there has been an increase in giving on the online thing. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, it is an honor to receive your gift, to receive your sacrifice, your giving, and uh, we will be good stewards of it. So thank you. I also wanted to let you all know that we are prayerfully thinking about and already starting to plan how we move forward in gathering together again. Uh, I, I was asked by someone <clears throat> just this morning, when do we plan on gathering together again corporately? And uh, I, this might sound like an overgeneralization, but my spirit says soon, okay? Um, I want to be honoring of the Lord and who He is and the faith that he gives us, because he gives us his faith. So I want to honor him in doing that. But I also want to honor those so he has placed an authority. I know that's not necessarily a popular opinion, specifically among some Christians. Uh, but I believe that when God uh, sets up authority in the earth, he sets it up in and through people. And so people who are in authority in governmental roles have uh, a position of, that is worthy of listening to and worthy of honoring. So I believe that as sons and daughters of God, there is a way where we can walk, where like Jesus told his uh, disciples and to the one who was questioning him about the tax, give unto God what is God's and give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So I believe there's a way to walk where you honor both. And that's what we're going to believe to do. So, And we're trusting that God, no matter what leaders of states or counties or nations believe, we believe that the Lord is Lord of all. That's really important. Whether or not they even choose to believe, the Lord is still Lord of all. And I believe at any point in time, just like he did with Pharaoh's heart, he can direct the heart of a leader like he directs a river. That's what the psalmist says. So we believe that the Lord is still in charge, still leading the earth. He's partnering with us and we're partnering with him in that leadership so we're believing that in honoring God and in honoring the mandates of state and uh, national officials that we are worshiping and we are walking in truth so that's how we're going to make these decisions uh, we're going to do that together so <clears throat> okay uh, so this is May this is a new month and uh, we spent April talking about the spirit world and resurrection and uh, some really important things were shared. 
uh, were revealed to us. And I'm really thankful for how the Holy Spirit revealed those to us. And I think we're still thinking through all of those things. Um, last week I presented uh, a lot of thoughts that uh, have been new to a lot of people. And I wanted to spend some more time talking through those and thinking through those. But I don't want to do that today. So instead, uh, what would normally have been a home group week for us, uh, this coming Wednesday will be our question and response time for last month's subject of resurrection and the spirit world. So if you're having questions, if you have thoughts that you want uh, further consideration on, join in on that Zoom call. Uh, we'll put that out there for you as far as a link to join us. Um, I highly encourage you to do this. And I'll tell you why I think it's important because you know, in previous years as a church and as a leadership, we don't talk a whole lot about what's going on in the afterlife or what's happening with angels or with demons or with the devil or all this kind of activity beyond the natural veil. Um, we're much more concerned with the output of that through our lives into the earth. Nonetheless, I believe it's important that we're skillful and that we do have some clear understanding about what is happening beyond the veil. Uh, of the natural realm into the spirit realm. So uh, I think it's important that you join in on that call Wednesday and so we can hear your questions or your thoughts and then we can feed back to you even some thoughts we've had since we've shared together. So that'll be Wednesday night uh, in a couple days. Okay. Um, I don't know a whole lot about technology and social media, but um, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to step away from the normal... Like, okay, now we're in May and we're going to talk about relationships. I am going to introduce that idea and the foundational concepts beyond that. We have a lot of time in this month to talk through those things. I'm looking forward to Wayne at the end of the month. Wayne Coons is going to share twice with us on uh, relationships. He and Ruth have extensive, uh, not only passion, but also experience in walking with people in and through uh, relationships. And so we're going to hear from them at the end of the month. So I want to lay some foundation for that today. But... I feel strongly that it's important for me to share a little bit on where my heart is right now uh, based on our current time and what the Lord <clears throat> is doing in me and what He is pressing into me. And uh, I want to share that with you all today. There's something about turning 50 years old. Uh, I don't know what it is, but I'm becoming less and less like uh, inhibited or reserved at the same time, I'm also becoming very discerning about my opinions and my feelings. So that almost sounds like those two things are in conflict, but they're not. I'm actually reserved because I know that not everything I feel is the Lord. But I'm becoming less and less inhibited about those things that are the Lord in me. Okay, And then as you've seen before on previous teachings and things like that, I, if I think something is just my opinion and I know it is, I tell you. And I'm very clear about that. But then I also am very clear when I think it's the Lord, okay? And I want to share with you over these last, I want to say two months, what the Lord, the person of Jesus, has been revealing to me and constantly emphasizing and re-emphasizing. And that first song or second song that we sang today about you remind me of things forgotten. That was one of the songs, right? And man, that line just struck me so strong as the reason why I know I need to share this today. So, why I'm saying I don't know much about social media and Facebook Live, but I'm pretty sure we're on Facebook Live right now. Is that right? Okay. And I'm pretty sure that if you hit, those of you that are watching right now, if you hit share on the Facebook Live that you're watching, I'm pretty sure that means more people will be able to see that you're watching this. And um, so when you turn 50 years old, there's this, uh, there's this concept in the Bible and the ancient Hebrews uh, celebrated this called the year of jubilee every 50 years all debts were forgiven all slaves were set free old covenants between people like i owe you this or you did this so now as a result of you doing this you have to do this all that stuff was kind of like canceled and the, the slate was made clean okay so when i turned 50 years old i feel like i have more freedom like i i don't um, what's the word I want to use? I, I don't feel like I have to be so reserved. I don't feel like I have to like, 
Uh, I don't know. But for whatever reason, when I turn 50, I feel like I can say what I'm thinking and feeling. It's almost as if, and I know that this term might feel a little weird to you guys, but I feel like I've earned an opportunity to be more free with what the Lord's showing me. For the last uh, 30 years as a believer, as a Christian, I feel like the Lord, and I've actually submitted myself to the Lord over and over again to train my voice, to train my thought processes, to allow Him that as I speak to Him from my heart and verbally, that He trains me. Okay, what you said right there, that was my heart in you. But that other thing, that tinge, that, that attitude about it, that was you. That was sourced in this world. But this is the part that was sourced in me. And for the last 30 plus years, he's been training me in that. And so now as I turn 50, I feel like, like all bets are off, okay? Like it's all brand new and I'm going to start bringing you thoughts and feelings that I have and I'm not going to be ashamed about them. I'm going to be less concerned about response and about reaction and actually, that's part of what I want to share today. So this is what I'm saying to you. I'm saying to you, hit share right now uh, because I want the church to hear this. Six days a week, the world is supposed to hear the Lord. Okay? Monday through Saturday, or if you're a Seventh-day Adventist or a, a Jew or whoever it is, then it's Saturday, but you know what I'm talking about. Six days a week, we're making the voice of the Lord through our lives known to the world. But on this day, when we gather together, it's for us to talk to one another. This is for us to remind one another of who we are and why we are. And so for the next couple of moments, I want to talk to the believer, to the Christian, to the child of God. I want to talk to the church. So if you would, hit share on this because I want more people to hear this. I want to talk to the church. I believe this is Jesus. I hear the Lord saying, remember me. Easter two weeks ago, we remembered the Lord in communion and we took of the bread and of the wine and the juice and we, we took the Lord in. And Jesus said, unless you eat this bread of who I am, you have no part of me. You have, you, 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 you're not who I am in the world. And I feel like the Lord is saying, remember the Lord. In this time, Remember me. Remember the Lord. There is too much reacting to each other. There's too much reacting to the news, to reports, to, to, to statistics, to things being presented. And I want to speak to the child of God that you are a child of God. Remember him. I ask that you put the pause button and maybe even the stop button and maybe even break the button about reacting to the things of the earth and turn. Don't forget, born again. The term born again means I've turned from being sourced in the natural realm in the things of this world and I've turned myself and I now re-originate re myself in God. So my words, my thoughts, my actions on the earth are of the realm from which I was created. I'm saying to you today, remember, church is the opportunity for us to remind ourselves and each other to look at the Lord. So here we are, we're together. Here we are, we're, I, I know together is not physical, but we're together, we're hearing this same word and I'm asking you to look at the Lord. Take your eyes off of social media. Take your eyes off of the news. Take your eyes off of the voices and the influences. No matter how good you think they are, no matter how righteous you believe them and convinced that they are, would you please just for a moment take your eyes off of them and look at Jesus. Worship is medicine for the natural perspective. See, looking at the Lord, turning our attention, fixing our eyes on the Lord is medicine for a sick, diseased, broken perspective of life and of people. And when we look at the Lord, we see us 
We see people. We see the earth the way he does. I know you're probably thinking, Mark, you have said this for a long time. If if you're thinking like that, please let it be brand new to you. Right now in this moment, I ask you, look at the Lord and let him wash your eyes. I think what we do too often right now is that we listen until we hear what we agree with. We search around and we look for voices and we look for beliefs and we look for uh, truth, facts that align with us. And then if we don't find or we hear a voice that does not align or disagrees or conflicts with what we think and what we believe in this moment, we immediately spout out what we're doing. Look, I'm just going to speak freely because I told you I would. I spent the first 20 years of my Christian walk, my walk as a child of God, submitted fully. And my spiritual dad knows this. I submitted my heart and my life fully to another perspective so that my heart could be cleansed, so that my heart could be washed. I walked listening, not assuming that anything that I had known, that I had studied in college, that I had believed was right. I know that might sound strange to some of you, but I knew that I needed my spirit, my my conscience washed in a new way of thinking, in a new way of life. And I'm going to tell you, believer, there is too many of us who are not listening to learn. We are listening to respond, to react, to teach, instead of to hear and to receive. And I think right now, what we need to do, just like, if you guys remember, those of you who are a part of WHO, in 2019, we turned to the Lord and we said, Lord, let our voices be known in the heavens so your voice would be known in the earth. That does not stop in 2020. I think right now, the moment that we're in, We are being called upon by a heavenly imperative that the sound that comes forth from us is sourced from where we were born, where we were originated. That spirit on the inside of you did not come from the earth. It came to the earth, from the heavens, from the author of all creation, from your Father. And when we worship, it's this great and holy reminding, oh yeah, he's dad, he's source. And in that moment, you're born again, again. And you're born again, again, again. And over and over, it's this ongoing washing, ongoing remembering. And the more we turn and the more we remember, the more it becomes our norm. And in the same way, this is how you were created. You were created to turn, be washed by God until you eventually like, that's who I am. But in the same way that you were created to do that, you were also, you can do the same thing when you turn to the natural. And the more you turn to the natural and allow the natural to supply you, to source you, to educate you, you become trained and you become of the realm you receive from. Okay? I know I've heard this, or you, I've said this before and you've heard this before, but I want to remind you, where you listen and then where you react to, this is so important, please hear this, what you react with determines your source. And you can hear it when it comes out of your mouth. You can hear it when it even is formulating inside of you and then you speak. And I'm asking you right now in these next couple of moments, would you turn with me and just look at Jesus? Because worship of him, attention on him, is medicine to our perspective. When we turn and we love on the Lord like we've just done for the last 45, 50 minutes, and we remind ourselves in his presence of who he is, we let him become the lover of our soul. See, He has always been the lover of our soul. That didn't change because we turned to the natural perspective and to the natural world and we were focused there and we were sourced there. He's always been the lover of our soul, but when we turn and we see him as he is, we realize the incredible value, the incredible opportunity 
We have, as human beings, to be loved by the Creator and the Father. And that love, as it comes, it reprioritizes our life and centers us in that love. And then we begin to return the love He gives us. He is the greatest and most effective lover of our soul. The facts you live by. The research you are basing your convictions on. Do they love you like he does? Do your political affiliations and your strong opinions, do they keep you sleeping peacefully at night like his love does? Do your feelings, as convicting as they might be to you, do they bring you the fulfillment and the satisfaction that the full-on love of God does. I say no to all those things. I know they don't because I've been in all three of those. And I can tell you when I have turned, I remember and I am washed in a love. I'm washed in a perspective. I'm washed in an abundance that causes every other thing, every other voice, every other influence to pale in comparison. Turning our affection to him consistently. Loving him with the love with which he loves us is the restoration of our soul. And this is salvation. Salvation is this ongoing, constant restoration of who we are. So I want to encourage you in this time, please remember the Lord. Please remember the Lord. And then secondly, this happens almost by absolute instinct of the Holy Spirit, you begin to remember who you are. You remember that you're a child of God sourced in Him. That's what happens when we turn and we remember and we look at who Jesus is. Look, Christianity, uh, uh, oh gosh. All right, I'm gonna hold off because I wanna say a little bit more, but remember who you are. You live as a natural representative. This is so important because I see way too many believers flipping this simple equation. You live as a natural representative, an earthly outgrowth of the one you are sourced in. Who you are is a natural representative, an earthly outgrowth of who you are sourced in. This is who you are. And if you want to see the most out of who you are, if you want to see the most productivity, the most abundance, the most life, the most production out of you as a human being, you will remember that you are not sourced in the world to reproduce the world. You are sourced in God the Father, who is Jesus, to manifest him, make him known, make him seen in the earth. This is who we are. Who you are in this world is not a result of the world, but a result of heaven meant to affect the world. That is who we are. I'm going to say that again because I think it's that important. Who we are in this world is not a result of the world, but a result of heaven meant to affect the world. This planet, the, uh, the vegetation, the air, every created thing is groaning. Look, that's not just a verse in your Bible that you look at every once in a while when a preacher finally decides to pull it out. This is the context in which you live. Listen, hear me. The opinions, the feelings, the up and down that you feel in this world, all of the conflict, all of the wars and the rumors of wars, all of the storms culturally, politically, emotionally, medically, they're all the groaning of the earth, okay? And I know that we feel like we're supposed to respond to groaning. I don't think so. I think you're to answer the groan. And you don't answer the groan by reproducing the groan. How you answer the groan is to turn to the doctor, to the healer, to the restorer, and you say, Lord, I hear the cry, and I want to respond accurately to the cry. And I know I don't respond to the cry with another cry that sounds like the cry. I respond to the cry from the healer, the solver, the restorer of the cry. And then I turn and I wash that which is groaning with everlasting, abundant life. Sons and daughters bring heaven to earth.
That's who we are. So I'm going to tell you what I see. I see, and this is going to sound overly like harsh and direct, but you just got to, you got to hear it. I am seeing a sorely lacking lifestyle of heaven among those saved to usher it in. It's probably one of the most harsh things I'm ever going to say publicly. I think the great deception of our time is Christianity. And I'm going to let that settle in. I think the great deception of our time is Christianity. One or a people who say we believe in God, yet live as if he's afar off, disconnected from the reality we are living. This has become somewhat of the norm of Christianity, to believe in a God who exists, who will one day take me to heaven, but in the meantime, he is disconnected and afar off, not able and ready to impact every situation, no matter how personal or how global. For some reason, there is this, I'm going to call it gross gap or void between that which is going on in the earth and the love, power, all-consuming everything of God. If we are sons... And that word son in the original language simply means those who have the same nature and character as the father. If we as sons, if we are sons, excuse me, then the manifest nature of God is not afar off, but resident with us as us. I, I, I want to say this again. If we are sons who have the same nature and character, that's the, that's the actual definition when Jesus says son, when, when he calls us sons, when the writers in the New Testament call us sons, it's the same definition. Jesus actually is not afraid to call us brethren, Hebrews says, of the same womb, Adelphos, Greek word. So we are sons. And if we are, then God is not far. He is close. He is as close as you are close to every natural situation. That is is and was always meant to be what Christianity is, is that God is near. Not some afar off deity that if we pray and hope he comes near. No, this is the mystery of incarnation. And the incarnation is not just Christmas. It is real now in every breathing moment of your life. Incarnation is God with us here in this moment, right now, May 3rd, 2020, in the midst of all kinds of weird stuff going on in the earth, God is like, I'm here. Engage me with the cry and the groan that you hear. The earth is to change more and more into the pattern of heaven by and through us. That's why I think this, that's why I made that statement that Christianity, I believe, is the great deception right now. Because we are deceived in believing that God, who is the maker of the heaven and earth, who holds all of this, not only in his hands, but I believe inside of himself, is somehow disconnected from this. And we're waiting for some authority or some medical lab to come up with a solution when heaven is just amped, anticipating being ushered in to the fullness of every problem through us. And yet we sit here and we wait for a solution, a, a drug, a, an edict from the government that makes things right. We even solicit and I'm not saying that solutions from God can't come through those things, but we don't see them as the source of the solution. He is still healer. He is still governor and authority. If we don't see this way, then I think Christianity is the greatest deception of the entire history of the earth. Because Jesus comes as flesh and blood, as son of God and son of man, to work in and through, not just you, not just me, but every human being to bring about what they had always intended, Father, Son, and Spirit for the earth. 
So for a moment, and I know it's already been a moment, but I'm going to ask for another moment. <laughs> Allow me to speak as a son. I, this is the way I currently understand the Lord and who I am in Him. God is a healer. God is a healer. God is, I'm going to go one step further, God is health. He doesn't just exist to fix and to heal that which is broken, sick, diseased. He actually comes to instigate and maintain health. He is not just a God who comes in the midst of crisis and hope he fixes it and then moves back afar off. No, he wants to come and be the central focal sourcing point for health in every area of our lives. This is who God is. That's who we are. We exist to centralize the earth in the one who created it. He is healer. He is restorer. He is health. And if he is, I am one too. So I'm a healer. My life is health and brings healing. I have to believe that or Christianity is a deception. So I am health and I am healing. When I speak, health emanates from my vocal cords. When I walk into a room, health begins to prevail over the atmosphere of that room. That which was sick, that which was broken, begins to turn and come back into alignment with what God originally intended. That's healing. Healing is taking th something from what it became because of its own decisions and has, it returns back to what God originally intended. His original design is the goal of restoration, of healing. And if he's a healer, I'm a healer. Secondly, God is a provider. He's always been our provider. From the Old Testament, Jehovah Jireh, when he showed Abram uh, a ram in the thicket that, that protected his son, so God is still to this day. And as his son, so are you. And this is so important. I want you to think about this in the context of your current reality that we're all living in right now. What an incredible time that the entire earth is living through and in the exact same circumstances. I am looking for what is common among us all. And you have to look to the one who created us, the one who spoke us into existence and this earth to find the commonality. And this is what I'm finding. God is healer, he is restorer, and he is provider. Please think of this in terms of your life right now. And as his son, so are you, so am I. In this situation, in this pandemic, in this economic, literal, like we are destroying an economy right now with a pandemic. And I don't want to say we, but it is happening. You are still a son and God is still a provider and he still wants to be who he is in and through us. So if that's the case, in a situation like this, I long to bless. I look for opportunities to give. I look for opportunities to offer freely because when the earth groans, I should not mimic it. I should offer what will bring healing and restoration to it. So as God, who is provider, I turn as his son, one who has his nature and his character, and I act, live, manifest, he who is provider in the earth. This is a time for you to heal. This is a time for you to manifest restoration. And this is a time for you to bless and to give. Not to go look at your bank account and hope you have enough and look for ways to get more. No, this is the opportunity. This is the time. Like Jacob, when he sowed in a famine and reaped a huge harvest. Go look it up. It's there. He sowed in a famine. That's who you are. You are a son 
who gives, who provides, who doesn't look for all these ways that they can get and gather and hope to have enough. No, that is a victim of groaning. You are a heavenly source in the earth. And God, more than even healer, provider, all of these are inside of God who is love. And as his son, so am I. God is love. So I want to share with you what it means that if God is love, if God looks at all of us, the earth, what's going on, what's happening, through himself who is love, this is what the earth is flooded with. Because I as his son am love too. As his son, I can wait a long time for something good to happen. In case you're wondering, this is 1 Corinthians 13, said in Mark's language. I can wait a long time for something good to happen. And I don't, in the midst of waiting, I, I don't let fretting, and I don't let the groaning in the midst of the waiting to distract me from that which is coming, that which is good, that which has a purposeful, beautiful, redemptive end. God is love, I am love, and therefore I can patiently wait for the goodness of God in every single circumstance. I will not scrounge to try to find it. I will not work hard to try to work it up. I will be at peace and rest in the one who makes everything work together for good. And as he's doing that, this is the most beautiful part about being his son. He actually works it in me first. See, that's what I have to wait for. I have to wait in that patience. Love is patient. I wait for him to work in me the work that makes everything work together for good. It happens first in you, then in the earth. If I try to make something in the earth that's not first in me, there's nothing to sustain it. So what first has to happen in me. If I am love, please hear this, every Christian, child, son and daughter of God, if I am love like he is love, then I treat people with the care that he treats me with. I treat people with the same care he cares for me with. That's kindness. Kindness is loving the way he loves. It's, it's, it's not loving the way we're loved. It's not letting the, the source, uh, the world source me in how I love back. That's, if, if there was any reason why I could encourage you not to react. Reaction is taking that which is coming at you from the world and regurgitating it and making it sound like yourself. But it's the exact same spirit. We do not react to the earth. Christian, child of God, believer, son and daughter. You are a son and daughter because you take that which the Father is birthing in you by His Spirit and you in turn bring it to the earth. That is kindness. If I am love, I am content with what I have. Go look this up. This is in 1 Corinthians 13. It's all there. Love says I'm content with what I have. Love says, I am humbly thankful for God's grace and mercy in my life. I realize that arrogance and boastfulness is the result of forgetting that everything I am and everything I have is because of the Lord. He spoke me into existence. His breath is the reason why I still breathe. And His very Spirit is the reason why I am able to speak to you today. And as a result, I have no foundational truth to be arrogant. So love reminds me to be humbly thankful. So I don't act like I know more stuff than you. I don't act like I've got it together and you need to listen to me. I don't act like you are ignorant and stupid because I live by the same grace that you live by. I am covered by the same mercy you're covered by. And I don't dare. Maybe I used to when I was younger, but not now. I realize love doesn't let me think you're lesser than me. I can't do it. 
because I realize that it's only by grace I stand here today. Because God is love, therefore I consistently practice seeking what is best for other people. Sorry, I skipped one. Forgive me. I'm going to go back to that. I act, if God is love, and I, as a result of being his son, am love, then I act in accordance with the nature of my father. This is, in my opinion, what the definition of conviction is. When I act outside of the nature of my father, immediately something inside of me twists. Something inside of me twinges. And I'm like, oh, I, I felt that. Yep, I stepped out of salvation. I stepped out of restoration. And I turned and I, act out, I acted outside of the nature of my father. And I, I, I stepped outside of love and I did something different. I walked differently than the Lord walks, than the Lord acts. If God is love and I am love, then I seek what is best for others. And look, I have discovered this in my own life. I used to have opinions what's best for you. And it's usually what's worked for me. And one of the greatest simple truths I've come to realize is that sometimes what's best for you is not best for me. And you know what? That's what's beautiful about our unity is that we can be diverse and we can be different. Are there some fundamental truths? Do I believe that? Yes. But the beauty is, is that our differences bring the color, bring the view. And so what I do, I turn. And when I look at the Lord, I'm able to look back at you and say, oh, okay, I get you now. Instead of looking at you through the filter of my own perspective of you, I get to look at you through him, through his eyes. I get to see how he thought about you when he created you. I get to see what he's doing in your life right now. There is no greater form of love in relationship than to look at one another through the eyes of who the Lord is in your life right now. Now, he may be putting his finger on something in your life. He is not putting on mine and vice versa. Just because he's doing something in my life does not automatically assume he's doing it in yours. And love says God has a work in your life and it is beautiful and I'm going to honor it. That's what it means to be walking in love with one another. God is love, so that means I get angry, but not easily. I'm going to tell you how and why I get angry. I get angry after a long period of hopeful anticipation of change. And when that anticipation over a long period of time doesn't take place, there's an anger. And I believe this is the Lord. It rises up in me. It, it's all part of his nature. It's all part of his character. I think when the Bible talks about the wrath of God, it talks about the full breadth of his emotional capacity. If you have an emotion, I promise you, it came from God. It's what you do with it and how you act in it determines whether or not it's sourced and you submit it to God. So God says that love isn't easily angered. So what it does is love waits a long time prayerfully and hopefully expecting change and believing for it. And then after a long time of consistently waiting, it sometimes rises up and says, hey, now come on. I know who you are and you know who you are. Love is not going to just let you just be whoever you want to be. Love waits and then love looks for the opportunity and if it needs to, it shakes people awake. It awakens them like a trumpet. Like a violent storm comes every once in a while and reminds us, oh, whoa, whoa, what is going on? And it doesn't just get angry over dumb little stuff. It doesn't get angry over something that was said in passing. In fact, love says, oh, yeah, they said that and it hurt, but I know why they said that. They said that because they're still going through this or the Lord's not sovereign over that part of their life yet or they're really hurting or they're really broken or they're past and you just kind of turn and you keep going. Love doesn't get angry over every little thing said. It doesn't react that way. Love gets angry when it's deeply meaningful, when it matters I think we've forgotten that as children of God. We've forgotten that as sons and daughters. And we let dumb things make us angry. If you saw the earth and people from his perspective, there'd be a lot of things that you just said, 
Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. God is love, and as a result of him being love, I think on every good thing about you. Every good thing you've ever done for me or to me, and not even to me or for me. I actually consider you and process you through the good things you've done for other people. I don't think about all the bad things you've done. Love turns, sees the Lord, turns back and sees you from his perspective, and what we see is awe. Like, we're literally in awe. You know when you are walking as a son, when you see people with actual awe. I know that sounds crazy, but we've gotten way too casual with each other. We've gotten way too comfortable with each other. And hopefully this season of time where we've kind of been apart causes us to kind of forget about the things that used to irritate us about each other. And we're starting to like fix our eyes on that which is beautiful about one another. And we're remembering, oh, you really are fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, you're incredible. And I remember that. And I will fix my eyes on that. And I will not turn my gaze away from how incredible you are. That is love. Love does not forget the goodness of people, the beauty of people. Love celebrates holy, righteous living. Something else that I think we don't do enough is we don't look at one another and say, did you see what you just did there? Did you see how you sang? Did you see how you decided? Did you see what you did in that moment? Woo! Like, that was awesome. That was you as you really were created to be. High freaking five, you rock. Love celebrates holy and righteous living and decisions to turn from the world and from that which bothers us and irritates us and causes us to react and turns to the Lord and it celebrates. And it doesn't miss an opportunity to say, did you see the victory that you just won? Like it reminds us, could you imagine if you had people in your life that consistently were just running around saying, oh yeah, you did it, woo! Like if you regularly had like this set of cheerleaders in your life that were just constantly like, did you see that? Did you see what you just said and did there? Like I think it would keep us fixed. We keep us focused. That's love. That's sonship. The earth has millions upon millions of these eyes and these voices in the earth right now. They're not afar off. They're not waiting to go to heaven to hear it. Heaven is waiting to bring it here. I, as a son of God who is love, I celebrate the culture of heaven restoring the earth. That is my party. That is my, my midnighter. That is my drink of choice is when I see heaven invade a situation and restore people. That is my party, my New Year's Eve. I don't celebrate just when someone agrees with me. I don't celebrate when I, when I see a political party win a victory or when I see something that I've always thought was right. No, I celebrate when I know heaven has restored something. That's love. I celebrate and I, sorry, sorry, I already said that. I have the capacity, listen to this, because God is love and I am his son, not just a Christian, but a son I have the capacity to carry the burdens of people and the earth without judging them as evil. Galatians talks about this. It talks about you who are spiritual, restore one that was caught in sin. You guys know this verse. The average Christian who's living in the deception I described earlier should not touch anybody stuck in sin. Don't you touch them. Hear me now. If you know that you are afar off from the definition that I'm giving you of what it is to walk like a son, I ask you, shut your mouth and take your hands off of your social media filled phone and stop talking and stop reacting because you who are spiritual have the capacity to restore such a one. A son has the ability, look at it in 1 Corinthians 13, to bear the burden 
of people. Yes, you have it as a son, not as one who reacts to the earth, but as a son, the heavenly realm fuses and fuels your your soul to carry the burdens of people and not judge them as evil, but to restore them. Literally be a steward of salvation. Because God is love and I am his son, I believe everything can manifest the best God wants and intended. As a son, I believe everything. I don't care how evil, I don't care how deceived, I don't care how broken a a plan, a situation, a scheme, anything seems to be. Because I am love, because I'm a son of the one who is love, I believe everything can manifest God and what he wants and what he originally intended. He is the great potter. He is the great artist. He is Redeemer. Don't just sing that word because some people put it in a worship song. Redeemer means we take broken things. We take diseased things. We take ruined, burned, charred embers of what once was. And we... (laughs) We offer them to Jesus. And love says heal it. This is a son. Just like Jesus on the cross offers humanity to the Father and says, Heal them. I see a bright and a glorious future because I am love. And because I'm a son of a father who is love, I see a bright and a glorious future full of abundant blessing. I don't see a future that is so different because of sin. I don't like new normal if it's the result of sin's brokenness. I like new normal if it's the result of heaven's restoration. So don't give me crap about a new normal if God didn't author it. I see a bright and a glorious future because I look to the Lord and then he shows me the earth and he shows me what he's doing in it. And that future is so full and so glorious and so bright that I live from that future now. And I fix my eyes on it, just like Jesus fixed his eyes. And because he fixed his eyes on what was coming and what his life was currently producing in the future, he was able to endure now. And he actually brought that which was of the heavenly realm, tore himself open, and the veil was torn forever. And we do the same every day. Because God is love and because I am his son who is love, when I live this way, no matter what happens, I and those whom my life directly affects can not fail. I say that as a son who walks in the Father who is love. No matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, you cannot fail. That's who love is. And love just decides, I'm not failing. And you're not failing. You're in my life. You're in my life. And because you're in my life, and because I love you, we're not failing. So this will not end in failure. I'm deciding that as a son and as a daughter, this will not end in failure or in some kind of new normal of brokenness. No. I declare as a son, and this is true Christianity. This is true child of God, son or daughter. No matter where you're currently sourcing yourself and spewing out information from, I declare over you today that the sound of heaven is this will not fail. We will heal. We will restore. Things will be made new. The end is better than the beginning. You see, science, medicine, statistics can't hold a candle to this person that I just described. Politics 
conservative, moderate, liberal, uh, economics, capitalist, socialist, or somewhere in between, have no sway in this person. This son or daughter lives above. And, I, I wanna, and don't forget, when we talked about heaven, it's not so much higher or lower. It's more into the center of that which is universal, that which centralizes and gives foundational power to everything created. It pulls us into this place, and we're not swayed by the surface. That's the natural realm. It's the surface. We're not, we're not turned by that. We feel it and we understand it, but we respond from this deeper place. This son or daughter is above, deeper than that. He or she lives from heaven, invading all of this reality with the culture of their loving and powerful father. Their every opinion, I declare this over you today, as a son or daughter, their every opinion is overwhelmingly saturated with what dad thinks what dad feels, and what dad always intended. That's what your opinion should be sourced in. What does dad think? What does dad feel? That's why I said for the first 20 plus years of my Christianity, everything I thought about, I felt like I needed to go submit it to someone who was already thinking more like God than I was. And I'm, one of the concerns I have for a lot of our young people, like 30, 35 and younger, is that like, I'm finding a lot of us yeah, and in that age group, like, don't even want to learn. Don't even want to listen. They're, they're smarter than me. That's what I'm finding. Even when I humbly, like, I, I want to tell you this. I, I have in many different cases over the last couple of weeks, I've humbly submitted myself, and I've asked questions of younger people. And you know, what's incredible? <laughs> and I know this might sound strange to you, but I, I just need you to hear this. No one asked me what I thought. I was double in age of some of them, or at least 15 to 20 years older than some of them. And when I asked what they thought and their opinion, not one of them asked me mine in return. And I just want to tell you, that generationally concerns me. Because I think we're, like, in this time, especially with social media-driven uh, thought processes, like, we're convinced that we're experts. Because we can find a news article to agree with what we already think. And that's why I said there's something deeper and higher. Decide today that your every opinion will be saturated in what God the Father thinks and wants and originally intended. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ is the manifest nature of God the Father who is Jesus, who lives in you and I. It is no longer you that lives, the you that was authored and born in this world system. No, it's no longer that one that lives. You were born anew. You were re-originated from heaven. And now that person who is Christ, the hope of glory, lives in the earth. Please, this is who you are. Remember it. Remember it. Give me two minutes and I'm going to just, like literally, two minutes and I'm going to introduce relationship. May 2020 is going to be the foundational truth of relationship. I'm just going to give you one verse. It's Genesis 2.18. I think it's really important that we kind of look at this from the very beginning. It says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. And we know that this is in context of uh, God fashioning out of man woman and kind of taking that which used to be one and separating them so they were able to enjoy relationship. But there's something really cool here. And I want to read this verse again, Genesis 2.18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. And I read that today, and I was thinking to myself, was the man alone? This is, wasn't God there? You know, like, there's a lot of worship songs that I, I sing that say, God, you are more than enough. 
Like, you're all I want. I remember that one song we sang back in the 90s. You're all I want. And now that I look back on that, I'm like, no, that's, that's not true. Like, and even God recognizes it right here that he, God, and at the time man, but we know it was Adam and Eve both together in one. God even looks at Adam and Eve and says, you know what? And I, this is not heresy because God says it. It's not good for man to be alone. God looks at man and sees that he's alone. This is a heavy revelation for you to realize that God wanted and knew and realized that the way he created Adam, that just he and God wasn't enough. You think about that. This is how God sees. This is how God looks at us. I think this is the foundational realization of relationship, specifically between human beings. God looks at humanity and says, it's not good for us to be alone, that we were made to walk in connection, in true exchange, which we can look at the uh, definition of relationship, and we will in the coming weeks. But I just, I want to lay that thing, and I told you it's only going to be two minutes. So it's not good for man to be alone. It doesn't mean God's not everything to us. It means that the way in which we experience him, I believe, is different than just me and God. He actually designed humanity to experience him and the fullness of the abundant life Jesus came to give through each other. You can't get away from it. Okay. I spent a long time talking. My voice is gone too. I just want to speak a blessing over you. Just receive this. I speak over you today that you're not just a human being who has a belief in God. But you are a son or daughter of God. You are fully, 100% sourced in your Father. The part of you which is controllable by you your heart beats without you telling it to. Your lungs breathe without it telling to. Your cells reproduce, die, and get born without you telling it to. Those are some of those things that are happening as the result of a God who just said, you know what, they don't have that kind of time. They don't have that level of, uh, we're just going to do that our, for them. But the level to which you can control who you are, I declare over you today, let those things be sourced in your Father. Because that which is already sourced in him without your conscious thought is doing pretty well, isn't it? So why not trust him with the rest? I offer that to you. You've already been given everything you need to be his son or daughter, freely offered to you in and through Jesus. Simply turn. Open that heart of yours, given to you by him. And let the one who made it, the one who authored it, the one who knows every physical cell, spiritual cell, emotional thought in there, let him have his way with your heart. You are his son, you are his daughter. Before you say another word after this blessing and after this prayer, would you submit it to him? Would you simply see yourself like physically taking the thought, the opinion, the belief you have and offering it to him and asking him, Lord, what do you think? And that which comes through the other side of him, speak that, live that. I bless you with that level of intentionality that you'll begin to live so completely submitted and honoring of the King of Heaven that it brings heaven to earth. May this week be a week of freedom for the whole earth. I speak that now. Would you join me in this? I speak that this coming week of 2020 would be a week of manifest, manifold freedom in the earth. 
I declare it over all the kings of the earth, all the spirits that roam the earth. I declare over you today that the Lord Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And this is the week we will begin to see the restoration of God's purposes and God's plans in our current reality. Things that were bound, be unbound. Things that were hidden, be revealed. Hearts that were turned away from God, be restored back. Things of earth align this week with the dimension of heaven. We speak it and we say, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all. Have a great week. Don't forget about Q&R Wednesday.